All right, now, everybody. Quiet, listen to me. We're going to start a show. Now, some of you people have been with me before. You know it's going to be a tough grind. But we're going to have a show. And good morning, all, from the giant mothership that is the Mark Thompson Show Network. Very excited to have you here. Kim is on board. Kim, how are you? You know, she's well, hello. working. She's got a lot of shows going herself. She's got her own show. She's got Nikki's show, this show. Big news today is that Albert's Albert, thank here, you. and it is his birthday. Albert! Woo-hoo! Yeah, happy birthday, Albert. Yeah. Used to be thank the- you, thank you. I'll fresh-faced be, uh, young man. He's not as uh, he's still f- fresh-faced, but uh, <laughs> not as young as he used to be. With every year that passes, the face is less fresh. Well, he his his physical. Um, I'd suggest his physical situation hasn't really changed too much. No, the lifestyle is definitely the same, Mark. I still live like I'm uh, 25, probably. <laughs> you do have a. A youthful exuberance to you, the rhythm of your life, Albert. I, I will give you that. But um, it's very cool that you're working on your Albert, birthday. Albert, thank you. I think that working on your birthday is a good thing. Making a little loot on your birthday, never bad. I've uh, got a really cool show for you today. I think you're going to be happy. Uh, in honor of Albert's birthday, we will um, we'll get into a couple of things. A notable passing, once again, weird, like right as we come on the air, very high profile passing. I'll get to that in a second. Well, that makes the whole birthday wall that I have for the background seem kind of, you oh, know, yeah. talking about death, but we just have a birthday. Yeah, uh, odd. Um, I'm celebrating Albert's birthday with the balloon background. Yeah, okay, right, exactly. We have to just draw the curtain on the sad. Kim, how are you? And, you know, kind of live <laughs> with the celebration, I think. It is his birth. That's a very, yeah. you know, I'm sure since no one is particularly technically adept on this show, that that took a while just to rally those balloons that Kim has gotten um, for you, Albert. It took me about seven seconds, I would say. Oh, seven yeah. seconds. Well, that's not, Kim, that sounds so. like you setting the bar low enough to reach it, so I appreciate <laughs> yeah. it. I, um, well, since I can't bring cupcakes to work, this is my offering. Very impressive. Yeah, Very impressive. You. Uh, everybody sends their best to Albert on his birthday, and uh, Thank you, we are. Joe Box your comments. and Thank Little you. Anthony. Yeah, Joe Box and Little Anthony are coming by later. What? What? What is that, uh, Albert? Uh, yeah, I, I do see all the kind messages in chat. I'd just like to. Say a wholehearted thank you to all of you. I can't yeah. respond to all of you individually, but thank you. Happy very birthday, much. Albert. Yeah. Albert is celebrated and loved by many, mm. and so uh, it's very cool that he's here today on his birthday. So, Albert, for your birthday, we put together a really cool show. Uh, there was a major, a couple of major developments in sports, and this isn't a sports show per se, but nonetheless, we'll share with you a couple of things that you know might come up in conversation. You may just want to be aware of them. Um, women's soccer, really bizarre and sad end to the women's um, soccer run. I will say this also, because all things, I guess, are political and all things can be politicized. I mean, Donald Trump weighed in on it just to, you know, in the grossest way possible, and I'll get to that in a second. Um, In the second hour, I've got a really cool book, an author who's joining us. It's a book. uh, 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 Check this out. This author, Steve Prokos' name, he saw this Civil War photo, and he took this Civil War photo, and he said, what if I track down the stories of all the people in this photo. So I ID everybody in the photo and I track down their stories. He did it and he wrote a book about it. And it's really interesting because it's a piece of civil war history in a, um, in a narrative that really brings to life what civil war battles were all about. So it's called captured freedom. You have the picture Albert or not? Oh, you don't, we don't have it queued up. Oh, there it is. Okay. Oh, cool. I was just looking for it. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, imagine the stories of all of these people, who they were. Apparently, they were wrong, wrongly identified in the photo. 
Mm. Um, and so he goes and through and does this historical research and tracks down the backstory for each one of these people. And the result is pretty fascinating. They were officers in uh, union regiments from across the country and they were imprisoned, you know, and, uh, he describes the conditions as POWs. It was, uh, you know, it was not, it was not cool, not good. I mean, they did not uh, get treated particularly well. So um, you can. This is no picnic, no summer camp. <laughs> it was. No. I like the. I mean, there's like <laughs> barely any water. There was. It was really. And the uh, the last thing I want to show you, and then we're gonna move on. You see the guy in the upper right. Okay, as you look at the picture, last row all the way to the right. That guy is 14 years old, and he fought in the Civil War, mm. and. His story I kind of read with particular interest because it's always interesting to hear how these guys anyway uh, come to, to, to this stuff and, and feel so motivated to be part of things. Steve Proko will be along and again uh, we'll discuss this book which is based on that photo. It's called Captured Freedom. So we'll do that beginning of the second hour today. Uh, I do want to get into, uh, first of all, smash the like button. You know all that stuff and uh, we'll, we'll hit you with all that along the way here. But. I do want to tell you that um, uh, the Mark Thompson, the show. women's soccer team did um, from the U.S. did not. It didn't go well. What happened, Albert? They got into a shootout, right? Let me put my credibility glasses on and I can speak to this. Um, what do you want to do first? You want to do the Major League Baseball fight or you want to do the soccer? Well, thing? We, can, we can start with the bad news. Uh it was okay. obviously kind of tough the, if you're following. I actually had two dogs in the fight because the Philippi Team Philippines was actually a part of the tournament. They didn't make it as far as the U.S. women's team did, but it was kind of an underwhelming tournament overall for the U.S. women's team. They usually kill it. So, Yeah, yeah. I, um, I, the, the reason this is particularly heartbreaking, and thank you, Luis. Happy birthday, Albert. You may set the bar low, but you're you are Hall of Fame in the hearts of the MT community. Best, True. my friend, Thank on you your much, birthday. Luis. Wow, that's really nice. Nineteen ninety nine, five bucks from Kelly. Big shout out. Big shout out. Thank you for the um, super stickers and super chats along the way, guys. Appreciate that. It's the way we uh, keep the lights on around here. Um, the Women's World Cup is the biggest bummer in U.S. soccer history. Reads the headline, and. The way it went down, I thought, was particularly heartbreaking. As Albert says, normally dominant. It all came down to a shootout, right? Yeah, the shootout is kind of... I do like the, I guess, the intensity, the mono e mono aspect of it. You get that in baseball. In baseball, it's just the pitcher and the batter. It's one-on-one, -on -one, especially in these high-pressure situations. So it was cool to see that. But it's, it is unfortunate that a whole game, you play 120 minutes, is ending in a not real... Well, well, not like a completely team-oriented aspect. Yeah, it's, it's, just it's true. Terrible. And but shout out the Sweden's goalie played out of her mind that whole game. The U.S. Well, had some and, opportunities, and even at the end, well, the U.S. kind of didn't do that well. But this she, was the uh, I thought the additionally heartbreaking thing. What Albert's saying is that uh, that goalie had to Sweden's goalie had to perform insanely well. Because the U.S. had so many more shots on goal than Sweden did. So again, that they played to a stalemate and that it had to go to a shootout at all speaks to, at least in part, the goalie on the part of Sweden. Um, the other thing that Albert speaks of is just, uh, here it is, uh, they outshot Sweden, the U.S. did, 22-9, to 9, putting 11 of those shots on target. Ten more than the Swedes. But it's been the case throughout the tournament. They couldn't finish. And the game ended scoreless. And, you know, this is the thing. It comes down to a shootout. That's the way they do it. I underscore Albert's, you know, general sense of that. It does work. You know, it's the way they've been doing it. But it is sad that it comes down to just this stuff. So what can we show, Albert? 
We can't show any of it, right? <laughs> no. Yeah, it's World, Cup, World Cup or Olympic related uh, uh, stuff. It's um, those, they will they'll demonetize us completely. Yeah, they they uh, love um, their content and they love to make sure it's just their content. Yeah, they will they will get rid of us if we do Zion that. Or a sucker. Uh, okay, so I um I it can't was a show it to you. Showing uh, in the end, I know twenty two shots, but the in the sh in the shootout when they did get to the the very end, it was just miss after miss and usually the the women's national team they usually make those in the high pressure situation so it was it's kind of like a change of guard a lot of the old players are leaving a few of the carryovers from the past few world cups are uh, i want i don't want to say aging out but i think they're th this might be their last go out oh no here, no so. they're they're reconstituting this team in a different way for sure you're absolutely right uh, the last thing i'll just say because j just to put a specific on it is um it did get down to the shootout. There were some key misses. Uh, but the thing that made it even more dramatic was that it came down, honestly, to a millimeter. The ball, after yeah, a save the on the part the, of the U.S. goalie. The, the U.S. goalie got the, uh, sa the save initially, and the ball flies up in the air. Unfortunately, we can't show it. It goes up in the air, and it does cross the line. Uh, behind her before she bats it away one more time so she she actually got two saves it was it. a double bat right a double yeah. save and yet when they went to look at the video review the ball had just again by a millimeter made it into the goal and the u.s yeah that's a save uh, in like it. the 70s mark for sure like with all right, this right 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 without that's video a, that's it's a, a save, save. <laughs> yeah um and of course as i mentioned donald trump he uh mocked the women's soccer team and called them woke. Uh, it was, he was gloating really over their loss. I mean, it, it's such a weird look. What a, what a lame ass thing to do, you know? But um, he says, Team USA's downfall was delivered by anti America, anti woman activist Megan Rapino's quote, and this is in capital letters, I should say, embarrassing free kick. Humiliation is complete. Intentionally sabotage Team USA. Mm. Blame embarrassing. Biden, blame Biden for it too. Embarrassing. How about a former president charged with conspiracy against America? Isn't that a little embarrassing? They are competing for America, pal. Okay, mm -hmm. for America. They are. So when you say anti-America, anti-America, these are truly brilliant competitors who are competing for America. I, I I don't, again, it's just part of the rancor, which is too much uh, in, in too great a supply through the American discourse or whatever you want to call it. I mean, if, if it's discourse, it's just social media crap, negative. Yeah, it's like, yeah, any American. I mean, that's what gets clicks and that's what gets carried. But it, it's just really lame. So and then anyway. if they win, it's like, oh yeah, good job, America. We, yeah, we right. did it. <laughs> right. No, no, exactly. Or it's ignored. Crazy. So that's um The Mark Thompson Show. That is the uh situation with uh soccer. I want to show you quickly something that happened in baseball, and then I promise no more sports. <laughs> then we can wait for the Niners. So Again, our sports editor, Albert, uh, you will explain, Albert, how this happened. I think when people see it, and you'll be able to see it on YouTube. Um, so I do have the radio broad. The radio broadcast is over the television uh, gameplay that is recorded oh, through a phone. So hopefully they don't get us for this. Okay. <laughs> but I did try to. Albert, thank you. Okay, yeah, let's give it a shot. I did try to find my way to play. Was, was he was kind of itching for a fight. Is that what happened, Albert? I think it was here. Let me mute it and play one more time. I think it was yeah. the when he the, squares off. Look at look right when he squares off with him. So he slides in. Okay. I think that, he had an issue. That's Ramirez. Yeah. Yeah. Ramirez had the issue with the with the tag because mm -hmm. he hit him clearly in the helmet there. And Ramirez uh, is the one on the in the red who did hit. Um, who's hit with the clean punch. with the clean blow? Clean, right. Yeah. Let me try to find uh, the photo because this. I, I try to find an obscure video of it. Yeah, so see, we're trying to find you a video. You're probably saying, well, why can't you get it? Because we're trying to find something that we can both share with you and also yeah. won't get us demonetized. <laughs> 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 it's the new world. Hey, and if you're frustrated, look, on KGO, we couldn't show you the video at all. Okay, so don't, <laughs> we would just be talking about it. So um, 
So there's that. Uh, it's an upgrade for sure. But um, and while I'm, while I'm looking for it, I'll, I will share that the a minor league affiliate of the Cleveland Guardians is having a a giveaway. I'm not sure you could read this. It's <laughs> Jose Ramirez Appreciation Week, and all fans named Tin get a free ticket to sit down on the grass at the game. <laughs> Wear your Ramirez jersey and get a free Bam Bam. Oh my gosh! And then there's a punch out competition in the '80s arcade. So. Oh my God! Yeah. So. Um. All right. Thank you. We're gonna move on, but that um that's the word of Major League Baseball. It was a, it was a fight that was over before it even had even begun, really. So. Um, the Mark Thompson Show. I do want to mention um. The passing, I will get to Clarence Thomas in a moment. I do want to miss, uh, mention the passing of a brilliant filmmaker, yeah. a guy named William Friedkin. You know him from The French Connection, from The Exorcist, from To Live and Die in L.A. He is not only an Oscar-winning director, but he was a brilliant speaker and a brilliant um, communicator. I saw him many times do Q&A before screenings of The Exorcist, French Connection, etc. And he really brings to life the filmmaker's dilemma and some of the stuff that he was doing. He, his, his films were brilliant. Uh, I keep using that word, but it, indeed the case. One of the most famous sequences in film chase history was the chase in the French Connection. Now, the chase in the French Connection, all you need to know is, for those who didn't see it or don't remember it, um, there is a uh, uh, Popeye Doyle, who's the uh, detective, New York detective, he commandeers a civilian car and chases a subway train on an elevated track and it is one of the most gripping, intense sequences you will see in film. And if you watch it, and you can find it on YouTube, there's no music. It is just pure adrenaline. Friedkin was inspired to do it by another film, and he actually spoke about that in an interview, I wanted you just to hear a little bit about it, and you'll get a little sense of William Friedkin, his brilliance, and uh, I think um, this comes to life in this little sequence. This is uh, him talking about the French Connection chase. The inspiration for the chase in the French Connection came from the fact that I had recently seen Bullet, and while I thought Bullet was a really had a great chasing and is an extraordinarily great movie, um, uh, in analyzing the chase scene, I saw that what they had done was merely clear the streets of San Francisco, put two cars on the streets, and run them through fast. So the first thing that occurred to me was, in New York City, there are thousands, hundreds of thousands of people on the streets at all times. I want to integrate these crowds into the chase. I'm not simply going to clear the streets, put... Uh, my chase car on the street and uh, let it go through uh, uninhibited. And then it came to me that there had been a number of films where a car was chasing a car. And so I thought, I've got to come up with something different. My motivation was simply to find a different way to film a chase. And then while I'm walking along the streets of New York thinking about it, I hear the subway rumbling b below my feet. And then as I went into... Brooklyn, I saw, to my amazement at that time, this is 1970, that there was still an elevated train. I integrated the, the uh, Coney Island subway uh, elevated train from Bay 26th Street to Bay 50th Street uh, as part of this chase. And it occurred to me that I really didn't know how fast uh, an elevated train could go at top speed. If it could go 100 miles or more, I couldn't do this chase. So I went to the head of the transit authority, and the first question I asked him was, how fast can a train go at top speed? And he said, well, we never let it get to top speed. I said, but if you did, he said, well, about 50 miles an hour. And it popped into my mind's eye. I had a chase. 
a car that the Gene Hackman character had uh, commandeered on the street could turn around and follow an elevated train if the train was doing 50 miles an hour top speed and the car was doing 100 miles an hour, which literally this car was for 26 blocks with no streets cleared and uh, with no permission to do it. And that's something I wouldn't, I really wouldn't do today. But as a kid, then I have to admit, I just wanted to get on film something that excited me. I mean, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. And when you hear what went into it, wow. And what a sequence. And you can go back and just watch that one sequence if you want. You can find it, French Connection Chase. And uh, I'd show it to you, but I don't want to get to, again, I just don't know that <laughs> I can do it safely. Uh, I will say uh, that The Exorcist is maybe a movie that you're more familiar with, and I'm, I'm just kind of noticing that a lot of people haven't seen The French Connection. You should see it. It's a, it's truly a, a tour de force of filmmaking from a young filmmaker. And The Exorcist, of course, is, you know, brilliant filmmaking history. And uh, he did to, to Live and Die in L.A., and there's a To Live and Die in L.A. chase scene, and that's... Terrific. So, you know, you pick your your spot, but um, cruising, rules of engagement, um, a remake of um, of Twelve Angry Men. Uh, he directed episodes of The Twilight Zone, CSI. But his brilliance, I think, is there in To Live and Die in L.A., Exorcist, and French Connection. That trio, William Friedkin, Oscar-winning director passes away at age 87. The Mark Thompson Show. Um, I have one other piece of trivia about William Friedkin, which you might enjoy, and I'll tell you this quickly, and then you can double check this. I think this is absolutely true. I heard him tell the story uh, multiple times. He couldn't get clearance. You heard him uh, reference that for that chase sequence. Imagine shooting a chase in New York City yeah. and not getting clearance for it. It's outrageous to consider it today, right? So he couldn't get clearance to shoot in New York City. And he wanted this sequence where Gene Hackman commandeers the car and chases this elevated train. And he wanted all that other stuff going on around. He goes to one of the top guys at the train authority, the transit authority in New York, the Metro Transit Authority in New York. And he says, I want to uh, shoot on this line. Can we do it? Um, and the guy said, no, you can't. I can't shut down a, a part of our subway line and have you use it yeah. for a film. I just can't be done. And Freakin said, there's no kind of permitting we can get. I mean, for this, he said, no, honestly. He said, if I permit this, you'll need to give me enough money to leave the country because they will <laughs> fire me and I won't be able to continue here with the transit authority. So Freakin says, well, exactly how much money would you need for us to do this and for you to have to leave the country? And the transit authority guy thinks and says, I don't know. $75,000. Now that might be That's it. No, well, that's the equivalent. Remember this is 1972 or 73. That's probably right. the equivalent of $750,000 today. Okay. Almost a million dollars is what I would yeah. kind of yeah. do, you know. Uh and so Friedkin thinks goes back to his people, I think, and gives the guy the money. <laughs> and the guy closed down that part of the New York subway so they could shoot that sequence and did leave the country. Oh, wow. And, and actually, like, moved to Jamaica or something. Like, like that Jamaica was it. or Bermuda, I forget what He's it was. Like, yeah, my the... last hurrah and I'm right. out. So everybody was on the level. It really did happen. What? So, uh, yeah, I know. It's a crazy coda. It's a crazy little footnote to that story, uh, to, that, uh, to that film, but pretty wild. The French Connection, and William Friedkin, director. Amazing. The Mark Thompson Show. Let's see what's happening with the uh, our favorite uh, corrupt Supreme Court justice. I mean, he finds himself in good company since there is a lot of corruption. 
No one can really keep track of it. They're above the law, as you're well aware. But Clarence Thomas and Alito himself also, they are tilling new soil, not only in their philosophical corruption, the fact that they reverse engineer decisions, they've decided already they are going to overturn Roe, they get into office, and they just find, quote, case law, even if they have to go back to the 1600s, to somehow support the decision that they've already come to, right? So now the supermajority, of which Clarence Thomas is a part, they do all of these things they want to do. Incredibly corporate-friendly, business-friendly, as I've spoken of at length, but also on these other uh, cultural issues and women's reproductive rights, basic freedoms, they've already decided what they're going to do. That's the philosophical compromise that they've already made, right? Alito, Thomas, Kavanaugh, the rest of them. Now you get the total corruption on the money side, the fact that they are supported by big money donors the same way a lot of politicians are, and so that there is a complete sellout, literally, to moneyed interests. And great reporting from ProPublica and beyond has brought a lot of this to light. The latest is something that was revealed in reporting over the weekend, Justice Clarence Thomas and his RV. Remember, he loves the... Uh, he loves the, uh, he's a, he, what, a, uh, what, where's the stock? Uh, I come from regular stock. I come from regular stock. That's right. I like a Walmart parking lot and his RV he picked up in the late nineties. And apparently this Prevost Le Mirage XL Marathon 40 feet long with orange flames licking down the sides. <laughs> he uh, he fell in love with it. And a few le- weeks later, after seeing it, Justice Thomas drove his new motor coach off the lot and into his everyman, up by the bootstrap, self-mythology, says this piece in the New York Times. There he is behind the wheel during a rare 2007 interview with 60 Minutes talking about how the steel-clad converted bus allows him to escape the, quote, meanness that you see in Washington. He, um... You are the meanness. He regularly refers to... He (laughs) refers to this RV and the RV life repeatedly. That's how we have the, you know, the regular stock and also that film that was done. It was a documentary film done by his wealthy friend that paints this sort of down-home picture of Clarence Thomas. I don't have any problem with going to Europe, but I prefer the United States. I prefer seeing the regular parts of the United States. There's something normal to me about it. I come from regular stock, and I prefer being around that. There he is with the RV. Hey, there's nothing wrong with having an RV, and there's nothing wrong with him spending his money on the RV, but it would appear that the reality of how he afforded the RV is different than what he was saying to friends, how he had scrimped and saved to afford the RV. (laughs) He did not buy it on his own. In fact, the purchase was underwritten, at least in part, by Anthony Welters, a close friend who made his fortune in the healthcare industry. He gave Thomas financing that a bank would not likely have been able to extend. Not only because Justice Thomas was carrying a lot of debt, but because the Marathon brand's a high level of customization makes its used motor coaches difficult to value. So there'd be no way to assess the value of this thing. Uh, He loaned Thomas the money, and he told reporters investigating this story for the New York Times that he... The loan was taken care of, okay? Um, Fully satisfied, he said. Yeah, yeah, satisfied. Now, again, when a loan is satisfied, that doesn't mean it's paid back, right? It means that the idea that that the loan is outstanding still has uh, ended. So the loan is taken care of. It no longer has any sort of 
hold on whoever was the loanee. The loner has let him off the hook, which is very possibly what happened here. He just kind of forgave the loan. But we don't have reporting on that. But because neither dude is weighing in on actually what happened, it's interesting to speculate, and it's fair to speculate, that the the loan was actually forgiven. The two men's silence serves to obscure whether Justice Thomas had an obligation to report the arrangement under a federal ethics law that requires justices to disclose certain gifts, liabilities, and other financial dealings that could pose conflicts of interest. Vehicle loans are generally exempt from those reporting requirements as long as they are secured by the vehicle loan amount. This so, wasn't it, just a vehicle, though. This this was a what? We, what year did you say? Ninety five. Ninety nine. Ninety nine. This was nearly three hundred thousand dollars. It's a rolling mansion, a but it's a mansion bus. This thing is like, it's incredible. Top of the I line. Come from regular stock. Yeah, yeah the okay. mansion bus right. stock. It's a mansion right. bus. I mean, that's not a. I lent you, you know, I don't know, ten grand to buy a used Toyota. This is a. You know, I lent you nearly three hundred thousand dollars to buy a mansion bus. Different. You wouldn't approve this if your husband uh, was excited about uh, getting this. No, one we're day? not getting a mansion bus. No. Um, no. Richard Painter, the White House ethics lawyer during the Bush administration, said that when it comes to questions of disclosure, the ethics treatment of gifts and income often paralyzes the tax treatment. Those intricacies aside, he said, justices, this is a quote should not be accepting private loans from wealthy individuals outside their family. If they do, you have to ask, why is a justice going to this private individual and not to a commercial lender unless the justice is getting something he or she otherwise could not get? Yep. That is exactly what's happening here. And well... I'll remind, maybe uh, yeah. maybe not. I mean, maybe he got nothing. Maybe it was a real loan between friends or maybe not. But when you do this, you open yourself up to questions. And that's what, you know, he shouldn't be able to do. I mentioned to you that, you know, a friend of mine was in the Obama administration in the cabinet. And he said, Mark, they don't want anything that even has the appearance of conflict of interest or corruption. He said, it's, impropriety, it's, it's, right. Yeah, impropriety. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the, uh, the deal with uh, Thomas, and we'll wrap up, is that uh, wealthy benefactors have essentially, you know, enriched his life, literally. Uh, many benefits on Justice Thomas and his wife, Ginny Thomas. Um, and we have the Ginny Thomas. Uh, I would like to thank yeah, the great woman it. named Ginny Thomas. Yeah, she and Clarence have benefited enormously from all of these wealthy benefactors. They... Um, Helped to pay for his great nephew's tuition, steered business to Mrs. Thomas's consulting firm, and buying and renovating the house where Clarence Thomas's mother lives, and inviting the Thomases on trips, both domestic and foreign, that included travel aboard private jets and a yacht. So, all uh, aboard the ethics bus. Yes. Right. I would like to thank mm -hmm. a great woman named Ginny Thomas. So Ginny Thomas and Clarence Thomas get fat off of wealthy benefactors who continue to get their way and do have justice-related business before the court. And that's the sad part. <laughs> The Mark Thompson Show. And the court is so completely compromised, as I was mentioning to you, both philosophically and now these other revelations. Uh, when we come back, I do have some um, kind of Bay Area uh, news. Stan Pollock, look at this. Good morning, all. I really like this new lineup. Hope we can keep it going. Yeah. Nice. I'm Stan Pollock. <laughs> big shout out to Stan Pollock. How about a big shout big out? Big shout out. Yeah. Stan Pollock, CPA. Lori from above the bar. Happy birthday, Albert. Love from Mark and Lori above the bar. Big shout Big out. Big shout out. Albert. I'm not going to cry, but. I'm not going to cry. I'm not going to cry. But what the audience is doing, the outpouring of love. I'm not going to cry. I'm not going to cry. It has me close. I think it it's Kim's close. birthday tomorrow, right? Kim, it's your birthday. And then. uh, What? Is that 
Is no, that right, Kim? Just, no, we're Not just me. trying to farm more birthdays. Kim, how are you? Birthdays for some some money. <laughs> Albert, having weighed in with, thank you, Buck, with his, um, with his Buck, by the way, with an after hours contribution, you know, you can do oh, super thanks nice. on many of our yeah. videos and Buck hit us with a super thanks. Um, uh, you, you see the dollar sign there under the videos. If you're watching and, you know, replay or whatever, I forget, it might've even been a short, I don't know what it was, but, um, but anyway, thanks Big for that. Shout yeah. Out. Appreciate everybody. Uh, you know, keep us on the air. That's the way we do it. Yeah. Um, the uh, uh, as I was saying, uh, there's a Bay Area story related to um, redwood trees, and um, I am going to touch on this superconductor thing. I think that that's kind of a. Um, I'm just going to spend a second on it, but that's kind of big news. A lot of VC money is going to this new kind of way to harness energy, and um, uh, we'll update um, a situation around California as well. As I mentioned, top of the next hour, it's captured freedom. The Steve Procco book, uh, which tells a Civil War story that I think will fascinate you. Vicky in Sausalito, big shout out. Big yeah, shout out. Thank I you. I love it, Vicky. Thank you for a, for a 20. And uh, really appreciate all the support. Yeah. Look at you, Sayo Jones. Thank you, Mark T. Elites. <laughs> love it. I love we have some. What's that? Oh, go ahead. I'm just going to say something negative, and nobody wants to hear that. Well, I do want to say um, a quick program note. Courtney cannot be here today because she has mm. a meeting. You know, she's a you know, she's it's building her important. own business. So yeah. yeah, what? She can't be here. I know. I'm not happy about it either. But um, uh, that's the situation. We will have uh, a full two hours today, and I do have some new segments coming this week, and a special announcement. I don't know if I'll get it in today or that's tomorrow. That's not fake. But there are... That's real. No, exactly. It's very real. So all that's still to come. Smash the like button like a boss. Mark Thompson Show. The Mark Thompson Show. It was great. I loved it. How would you handle this? We could try ignoring it, sir. Morning. You cannot say you love your country. Where are my weed smokers at? Stay at home and get baked. On the Mark Thompson Show, I'm Kim McAllister. Let's begin with the former president. A federal judge is giving former President Trump until later today to respond to special counsel Jack Smith's motion for a protective order. So Smith filed the motion Friday after Trump posted on Truth Social, if you go after me, I'm coming after you. Well, Trump pleaded not guilty Thursday to criminal charges connected to his alleged efforts to overturn the 2020 presidential election. And again, now it's uh, it's up to the courts to decide what he can say, what he can't say. And even if they decide that, will he abide by it? I mean, it's really the case that somebody has to curb this dog because there are real world consequences as a result of this. I mean, you know, people can get violently attacked. I mean, this isn't just a... Uh, yeah. You know, and he is throwing everything up against the wall to see what sticks. So he's trying to marshal any support, violent or otherwise, in my judgment. I mean, he really is bringing out the kitchen sink in terms of what he's saying about prosecutors and anyone involved in testifying against him. So as evidentiary elements become obvious to him, in other words, through uh, you know the disclosures that come with the ramp up to trial, he's able to call out more and more people. You know, he's able to see essentially a witness list. So it's a extremely dangerous situation, and I think the court does have to lean in on him. And when you hear those words, "If you go after me, I'm coming after you," it sounds threatening. And what does that mean? Does it mean he's sending his minions? Does it mean it's open season on the prosecutor, special prosecutor? What does it mean? I don't know. Former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi is warning of the implications of a second Donald Trump presidency. In an interview with the New York Magazine, Pelosi said, and the quote is, we will not be the United States of America if Trump wins the 2024 presidential election. She said there would be a criminal enterprise in the White House. Pelosi had a highly contentious relationship with Trump during his term. Trump now considered to be the front runner for the GOP nomination in 2024. 
And she's not wrong. She's really not wrong. It's scary to think about. Let's move on to President Biden, um, because most Americans disapprove of President Biden's handling of climate change now. The Washington Post University of Maryland poll found 57 percent of Americans disapproved of President Biden's handling of climate change. The poll also found just 27 percent were familiar with Biden's Inflation Reduction Act, a bill he claims helps fight these growing problems. In Minneapolis, um, a former Minneapolis police officer, I should say, who held back the crowd during George Floyd's arrest in 2020 is now being sentenced to prison. Tu Tao was sentenced to four years, nine months for aiding and abetting second degree manslaughter and the death of George Floyd. Tao was already serving a three and a half year sentence for a conviction on federal charges of violating Floyd's civil rights during that incident. Yes disturbing story. This, of course, uh, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky and his wife. Well, now a Russian informant is being detained in Ukraine in an alleged plot to assassinate President Zelensky. They've been after him since the beginning, right? The woman now being questioned about working to find information on an upcoming trip that Zelensky planned. Ukraine's Secret Service says the informant was trying to find the details of his itinerary to give that to Russian officials. Jeez. Mm, yeah. I mean, that he has to be careful at every turn. Remember at the beginning of the invasion of Ukraine, uh, there was a price on his head and he had to hide from place to place. And I, I don't know if that's still the case, but yeah, they're out to get him. And that has not changed. There was a really big drug bust made at Calexico. That is the uh, the port of entry here between Mexico and California. Here's some of what they found. Uh oh, what? Yeah, beneath the floorboards this time. Wow. This major drug bust, the Calexico West Port of Entry in California. That's where they uncovered 41 packages of methamphetamines concealed in the floorboards and the seats of a sedan trying to cross the U.S. border last week. Officers found plastic wrapped packages in the floorboards on initial inspection, which set off a secondary inspection. The CBP, California Border Patrol, or uh, found packages weighing in at just over 240 pounds. They have an estimated street value of more than $360,000. The 20-year-old driver busted, detained by Homeland Security. Yeah, under the floorboards. I, I think you could have done better. I'm just saying. I, <laughs> I, I'm disappointed. Thought, that was. You didn't feel that was a wild enough idea? Ooh, it's, it's a wild idea, know. but it just might work. Didn't work. Didn't I think there could have been better efforts. I, you know, I'm just, You're disappointed. I, There's no good uh, drug smuggling going on. No quality no. drug smuggling going on in your view anymore. It wasn't creative enough. I just don't think so. This is Speak part of the decay of the world, <laughs> would you say? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you've got to, yeah. you know, come on. Yeah. You're going to get come those drugs through. Come up with a real caper. Yeah. That's right. Hot air balloon, something. I don't know. Um, a new study shows just one in five adults addicted to opioids get medication to treat it. Only one in five. They say more than 80,000 people died from a drug overdose involving opioids in 2021. It's a number that has surged recently. The National Institute on Drug Abuse and Prevention says white people are more likely than black people to receive treatment. Hmm. Imagine that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean... Not a commentary. That on doesn't society. seem consistent with anything else in the country. I don't know about that. <laughs> I mean, yeah. On to happier news. Look at that. Ooh, don't you want it? Maybe. A Los Angeles Lakers jersey worn by Wilt Chamberlain is going up for auction later this month. Mm. Sotheby's officials believe the home gold uniform worn by the late NBA legend. Don't will sell say it. Don't for say about how much. Don't say how much. How much is it going to sell for? How much would the jersey worn by Wilt Chamberlain? transformational figure in the NBA, how much would that fetch? How much do they think it's going to fetch? At me, before you make your choice, let me tell you a little bit more about yes, this. Yes, tell us jersey. about it, please. 
He wore it, Chamberlain, to Game 5 of the 1972 NBA Finals between the Lakers and the New York Knicks, and that was the night the Lakers clinched their first championship since they moved to Los Angeles in 1959. The 7'1", 275-pound center was part of a Lakers team that won 33 consecutive games during the 71-72 season. That is an NBA record that still stands. The jersey currently on display at Sotheby's Beverly Hills Gallery. It goes up for bids online August 28th through September 27th, and it is expected to sell for how much? Uh, we're getting a lot of guesses. Uh, I don't think it's going to, I mean, I can't imagine three and a half. Shadow producer Calvin Wong thinks three and a half million. 6.66 million, says Sayo. It's uh, famous. A lot of others. It's a famous jersey, a famous man, famous game. One point three <laughs> says huge in Japan. One hundred and fifty thousand says square seems low to me. Uh, I'm ready. What's the actual retail price expected? The folks at Sotheby's believe this will sell for about four million dollars. What? Wow! You were right, everybody who went for the um, multiple millions. I think a lot of people in the chat were close. Man, four yeah. million. That's real. Four money. million. And I mean it's from the seventies, so it's kind of probably falling apart a little bit. I don't know. It's an old <laughs> jersey. Yeah, I'll give it some love. But yeah, in well, the you're not wearing case. it out. You know, you're just uh, right. But I, I I take your point. It's not in yeah. the pristine. Look at that. Mackay had it. Four million. How about you, Mackay? Okay. Four Very million. Very strong. Yeah. Mark, are you telling me you're not gonna put one of those on and uh, start playing basketball on it? <laughs> Parade around the you, house. You know, if you've paid, you know, anything. If you dribble uh, to the left. If you've paid you, with your, you know, if our Clarence Thomas and some rich guy just bought it for me, then I I might throw it on, you know, it's not because I don't really have any skin in the game. But if I had to come up with my magic beans to buy it, no, <laughs> I'm not going to be. Maybe Thomas it. will buy it for the house bus. Maybe the mansion oh, bus. That's true. Yeah. yeah. You could hang it up in there. Sure. All right. Let's move on to our last story of this newscast becky Graham... says i'm from the 70s and i'm holding up okay so maybe the jersey's <laughs> still okay <laughs> you and me both becky you and me both yeah grand rapids michigan is being voted the best beer city in the united states for the third year in a row it's a three-peat <laughs> there's a reason that this place is fun oh wow usa today announced the three-peat friday as part of its 10 Best Reader's Choice 2023 Awards and announcing I'd be the willing award. to bet my lunch that there's alcohol involved. <laughs> yeah, I think that's yeah a good you guess. would be yeah. correct. USA Today wrote, the city's official Beer City Ale Trail lists more than 80 breweries in the surrounding area, and the local calendar is constantly filled with beer festivals, events, and promotions. This is in Grand Rapids, Michigan, where apparently the beer is a-flowing. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, this report is crowdfunded, which means that we rely on you to fund the show. You can find more information about the Patreon and the PayPal links at themarkthompsonshow.com. Themarkthompsonshow.com is where those links can be located. And of course, the Super Chat is live, as you have seen here on the show. I'm Kim McAllister on The Mark Thompson Show. Who's Mark Thompson? Feels great, baby. It's unbelievably offensive. Ross Gator just sent me a book. Did he send you one too? What he's got going here is a situation. Put up your pants, my man. Pull up those pants. You cannot say you love your country. Let me kick down the door and talk to my cheap sons and daughters. Don't make us beg. Subscribe, like, and share. Mark Thompson Show. Why are you yelling? It's all there, black and white, clear as crystal. What's a guilty pleasure you have? Yeah, what a 
up, everybody? Thank you for being here. Mark Thompson Show. I'm Mark. Him. It is Albert's birthday again. We all have a little extra bounce in our step as a result of our uh, our love of Albert and the fact that it's his birthday. In fact, uh, let me put my credibility glasses on to see that. Happy birthday, Albert, from Karen Combs. Love the show, Mark, and team. So glad I still have you to listen to. Karen, thank you. Big shout out. Big shout out. And uh, appreciate the contribution of 10 bucks for Albert's birthday. Thank Yay! you so much. Thank you so much, John, too. John <laughs> Woodward. Yeah. Trump 2024. Trump 2024. <laughs> where is the, um, where do I have that, Albert? Did I put that somewhere? I'm uh, uh, Tony actually was up this weekend and repaired some of my stuff, but I have yet to load it because it all got fried. So all my, a lot of my drops and stuff are gone. <laughs> and I have to reload them all. It's not easy. Um, you know, they do this to me all the time. I don't know what the hell they do exactly, it for. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that Trump 2024 is, is, pretty, um, is pretty great, though. I'll, I'll find it before the end of the day. Um, the, um, the thing I wanted to tell you, I've got a... I wanted to, sh you mentioned this in your news about um, uh, a climate strategy and, you know, uh, the fact that Biden in polling was not embraced by, we never know how a question is asked in polls, but yeah. um, by those who are being polled on his policies regarding climate change okay so i don't even know what that means i would imagine if you talk to most people they don't even know what his policies are on climate change but um the republican strategy okay if you wanted to compare uh, sadly that's what you have to do nothing exists in a vacuum we're all okay. looking for our perfect presidential candidate and we're all we're all looking for them as though uh this is a dating service, and we're looking for somebody who checks all of our boxes. Well, I want him to have long uh, walks on the beach with me and read me poetry. If he can play the guitar, that'd be great, so he can yes. compose music. All the right? above. And I want him to have a lot of money and care about me. And be good okay. looking. Sure. And have Sadly, a job and a full set of teeth. In the real world, we're no? all making compromises <laughs> all the time, right? And in politics, you really have to make a compromise yeah. because to survive this uh, this rugby scrum of politicians who have to, you know, be on the stump, get financial support, get uh, the support of certain constituencies, it's a real, uh, I guess I'd call it a steeplechase kind of. You have to leap over one thing or another. So anyway, you don't get with these perfect candidates. So when they say they don't like Joe Biden's plan on energy, hey, look, I'm a tree hugger. I don't like it because it doesn't go far enough. Okay, this is a crisis. We're in trouble. And do you want to lead the nation or not? Now, the reality is that fossil fuel has infected, fossil fuel money's infected Washington and all these legislators. So it, you really can't make a difference in the, it, it, the overall realities are fairly grim. But let me show you the 2024 climate strategy from the Republicans. This is a conservative, quote, battle plan for the next Republican president on climate change. It would stop attempts to cut the pollution that is hitting the planet and encourage more emissions. The move is part of a sweeping strategy dubbed Project 2025 that Paul Dons of the Heritage Foundation, the conservative think tank, they've called this the battle plan for the first 180 days of the new Republican president, whoever it might be. The climate and energy provisions would be among the most severe swings away from current federal policies. The plan calls for shredding regulations to curb greenhouse gas pollutions from car, cars, oil and gas wells and power plants, dismantling almost every clean energy program in the federal government and boosting the production of fossil fuels. And of course, Fossil fuels burning is what's causing planetary warming, but leave that out. You know, I've talked before about just pollution. If you're just concerned with pollutants, the toxification of the environment, then you should be for electric vehicles, which at least pull back on some of that. I understand that the electric grid has to be fed by fossil fuel burning, but the reality is you're not bathing in carcinogen, carcinogens and toxins if you begin to pull this stuff out of the environment. 
the um, leading Republican presidential candidates were all asked whether they support Project 2025. None of the campaigns responded. But the recommendations match positions held by former President Donald Trump. Also, uh, if you look to DeSantis, he's got similar plans, right? Dismantling all energy efficient strategies and drill baby drill is basically where they are. They, um, they have full, and this is the difference, I think, with a Donald Trump presidency should he get back in the second time. And, I, you know, I, I feel it's not out of the question. There will be strategies that will be in place already to execute on a lot of this stuff. So the first time Trump didn't expect to win, no one expected him to win, he and his people did not expect to actually win the presidency. And so when he got there, there was no transition plan. There were no strategies in place. He, he got these, uh, as you're well aware, uh, lobbyists to, who'd sued the EPA to run the EPA. Um, it's same story at Interior, same story at, at Commerce. You know, these guys were just uh, bought and paid for. But that said, I mean, it's not, that's just not my opinion. Uh, they had to resign. Uh, there were, what, three or even five resignations because of uh, corruption. Uh, but my point is simply, the second time, they will be prepared. And this is an evidence of a thousand-page plan that would basically reshape the executive branch to place more power into the president's hands. They outlined changes for nearly every agency across government. The Heritage Foundation worked on the plan with dozens of conservative groups ranging from the Heartland Institute, which has denied climate science completely, to the Competitive Enterprise Institute, which says, quote, climate change does not endanger the survival of civilization or the habitability of the planet. Um, I just want to mention it because as we talk about, well, you know, Biden's got low marks for how he's handling the yeah. climate situation. Yeah, there's a radical plan waiting off stage. And all well, they have to do is win the presidency to get it done. Uh, that study showed, though, that a lot of people don't even really understand what his initiatives are. So I think it's not only, you know, they disapprove of it. They actually just don't know what it is. They haven't right. looked. Not that his climate initiatives are the best. I mean, here's someone who uh, went for the Willow Oil Project, right? right? So there's a lot still to be done there. But yeah, as you're talking about the lesser of evils, Absolutely. I mean, yeah, you can't. There's a choice in the end, it, right? And it seems like, honestly, it, the environment is something that it shouldn't matter what party you are. I mean, do we all want to leave a better world for our kids? Do we all want to not, you know, suck up microplastics every time we take a drink of water? I mean, that should be something we could all rally behind, right? Yeah. It's positively disgusting that we've toxified the environment that we have. And we're all getting cancer younger. And I mean, all of the. Um, all of these elements that affect our immunity and our immune systems, they're, they're all out there now in tonnages that must be pulled back. And yet, clearly, the GOP is on the opposite course. Again, uh, the Democrats don't go far enough, but at least they're articulating the right thing and they go out, to, uh, they go out um, in some ways. Uh, I, I'm halting because I'm thinking, well, you know, I've heard this. Well, you know, Joe Biden isn't really any different than uh, Donald Trump on environment and on drill, baby, drill. Yes, he is. Yeah. Yes, he is. That's a total. I get it. Everybody's bought, bought and paid for. I say it myself. But come on. I, I think we have to be honest with that and say, no, they're not the same. So <laughs> the Mark Thompson show. I'd be happy to talk the economy with uh, with you as well, but I can't do it today, but maybe later this week. I, um, Albert, I want to ask you, first of all, you got so, you got a lot of love, as you know. You probably saw it during uh, my remarks. Um, yeah, Harry Magnet. Albert needs a Martini at the Red Jack. Yes, he does. Well, he's got a Martini. It's called the Martini. <laughs> 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 Thank you, Harry, for... Um, for 10 bucks big at, shout out in uh, honor of Albert's birthday. Happy birthday Albert from Social Butterfly Beauty. Thank you so much. Aww, yeah, thank you so nice. much Social Butterfly Beauty. Albert, bringing all the boys to the yard and the girls to the yard.
Right. Thank you so, so much. Thank you so, so much, Albert. I wish you had... Yep, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. I wish you had more birthdays, Albert, particularly if it brings in... It'd be nice uh, to have a couple of those a year. Yeah. Yes. Any plans for tonight? You have big plans? Uh, dinner with the friends. I just came back from my trip. Obviously, I was gone last week, and then I have just dinner with the family today. And I know nice. you're a very private person, but can you tell us anything about your trip? Oh, it was great. It was great. I solo trip to uh, Pacific Northwest. I did meet up with a couple friends up there. It did cross the border up in a free healthcare uh-huh. land. Yep. Mm. And then I, I got came up to back. Canada. Yeah. Yep. Got out to Canada. Um, was there one highlight, or was it all just uh, magical? It was yeah, it was pretty magical minus the Disney magic. It was just a regular magic this time. No, uh... <laughs> I'd be willing to bet my lunch that oh, there's alcohol with, that, that, with with Albert. I promise. Of course, yeah, Albert. I did. I did. I did befriend some people. I was staying at hostels during this trip, and I did befriend an Irish guy. So um, uh, oh. we had a lot of uh, we partook in the activities that they like to enjoy. So, wow, I love it. Well, that's very, very cool, Albert. I'm glad to hear that you, Albert, uh, thank you. did so well with it. Smash the like button for Smash Albert's birthday. With your iron rod. Give us a thumbs up. It costs you nothing. It does help us. Um, I want to get to this interview, and then I'll put the bite on you to support us, but I'll I'll just move on. Do you mind, Kim? And then we'll do a super Agreed. Size. No, so, yeah. please. I okay. can't wait to hear it. I'm so fascinated by this. Yeah, pretty cool. So uh, smash the mm-hmm. like button. We'll, um, I think, get a, uh, a good sense of a an interesting story next so all that to come uh hey, which one you use mark thompson who's mark thompson the mark thompson show i have the book here um that i'm uh, excited to uh to show to you and save and uh, share with you i should say steve Procco wrote it it's called captured freedom and it's I mentioned this in the first hour, on its cover, it has a photo of those people from the Civil War, these are all soldiers from the Civil War, who were taken prisoner. They were officers in the Union Regiment. And Steve Procco went back and figured out the actual identities, because they had been misidentified, I believe. And then the backstory and then he puts that backstory into a context of the Civil War and everything that was going on. He's with us now, and he can uh, explain more. Steve Procco, everybody. Hi, Steve. Thank you. How you doing? Captured Freedom is the book. It's so interesting that you were so intrigued by this picture, I guess. How did this come to you, this idea to track this down? Well, I was researching for a documentary and uh, that had a Civil War topic behind it. And somebody shared this photograph with me in a chat room and kind of asked me, what do you think of this one? And I'd never seen anything like it. I mean, you see pictures from that era and they're, you know, a couple people or whatever, but a big picture of 12 ragged men, uh, very interesting. And the, the guy said to me, well, the guy on the far left is my two-time great uncle. And uh, so that that just really intrigued me. And I just wanted to find out what the story was on the men in this picture. Uh, there it is. Yeah. So what are the, were they misidentified, Steve? Tell t- t- Was it difficult to ID them? Were they misidentified? How did you go about it? They were misidentified in different places. The picture, uh, I immediately found it in a couple of major institutions, Library of Congress, National Archives. When I got to Chicago History Museum, they had completely misidentified them. And then I found that to be the reoccurring theme, that some of the men would be correctly identified or the entire group would be completely misidentified. And so it really was kind of like, what was the story here? And why did that happen was part of the part of the trek that i kind of took obsessive trek that i took <laughs> and they yeah. were they were pow's weren't they uh in the picture there's nine union officers who were prisoners of war uh, and three others that were mountain guides from north carolina who helped them get through the mountains they were prisoners in a uh prisoner of war camp in columbia south carolina 
uh, but they had been moved all through the South. They started, five of them started up in Richmond at a really notorious prison called Libby Prison. So that there was a whole uh, months and months and months story of them being moved around and what their lives were like. Uh, you in, talk about Libby Prison, I think, in the book, and you were talking, I mean, it's, it was hard to get clean water there even. I mean, it was just a, it was a pretty brutal existence. Yeah, a uh, three-story building with a cellar. Um, Two stories at the top, they they packed 1,200 Union officers in. Uh, it was open, barred windows that if you got close to, you'd get shot, and many of them did and were killed. Uh, they shot a guy, as I just trying to remember from the book, they shot a guy who was just like reading a book there, just sitting in the window reading a book. He had shot in the head, and they killed him, right? Yeah, yeah. They uh, the they called it target practice for uh, the, the, uh, the guards below. And uh, so, yeah, you had that as a brutal situation, uh, getting close to the windows just to try to look out. Uh, but you also had these windows that were open. So in the wintertime, it was, you know, freezing temperatures coming off of the James River, which the, was where the prison was located. And um, men sleeping on a hard floor, spooning with each other to try to stay warm by the hundreds. I was interested so. when, when, you know, and again, I'm happy to talk about any one of these guys who you, um, there's just so many stories and they're stories off of stories. Your book is really interesting. And I was just looking at the picture. I was intrigued by the guy I was telling the audience this last hour, top row all the way to the right. That's the 14 year old, right? Yeah. T.R. Zachary I, was his name. Yeah. yeah. Um, Tell us about a 14 year old in the Union Army. Well, he was actually one of the guides from North Carolina, and the men passed through his, uh, he lived in Cashier's Valley, which is in the western part of North Carolina. They passed through his family's farmstead, and uh, a couple of the men passed through initially, and, and he asked his father if he can help them, you know, as a guide along the way, and uh, uh, his father didn't allow him initially and then let him go with the next group of men that came through. Uh, all of these guys were moving in parties of one or two, and then they all came together towards the end. But uh, T.R. Zachary um, was just 14 years old and in a family that was divided. The Zachary family, half uh, or maybe more than half of them were uh, very much in and behind the Confederate cause, but his father and, and his uh, brothers were not. And uh, it divided the family, which was the kind of a story that reoccurred uh, throughout the Civil War in that region of the South. The uh, other thing against sort of the backdrop of the Civil War, you fill in some details. You talk about uh, black uh, regiments and the way they were commanded, I believe, by white officers. I wonder if you just give us a sense of the war itself, like that kind of texture I thought was very intriguing in your book. Yeah, as the war progressed um, after 1863 or so, there was a determination that they could use uh, enslaved individuals who had escaped uh, or free uh, black citizens in the North uh, to become regiments and fight. And it was also determined that they needed to have officers. Uh, at the time, it, had, it was a decision of, these need to be white officers. So they went through a whole period of finding officers to lead the black troops. And um, one of the men in the photograph was a uh, lieutenant. He, he started the war out as a corporal and then uh, interviewed to be an officer and was accepted and became a lieutenant in a black regiment. It was the 19th USCI. USCI stood for United States Colored Infantry. And um, so at the end of 1863, he uh, became a lieutenant in, the, in Company C of this regiment. Uh, they trained in the Baltimore area. They walked and marched through Washington, D.C., and President Lincoln saw them and their entire regiment. And then they went into battle in Virginia. But they were primarily used as guards to protect the back of the different regiments that were there and the, uh, didn't really engage in battle until 
he was captured. Uh, Steve Proctor is our guest, and uh, the book, as I mentioned, is Captured Freedom. If you have any questions, please, uh, you can you can uh, put them in the chat, and I'll try to integrate them into our conversation. So these guys knew each other or only knew each other through the military? Some of them knew each other because they were in the same regiment and had been captured together. There was three of the nine officers that were that way. Two more were in a Kentucky regiment. The rest were all individual officers who had been captured and ha they had all come together in Columbia, uh, ultimately in October of 1864. And um, uh, when they all escaped, they either escaped in groups of a few people or individually, but they ultimately all came together in the mountains of North Carolina. And when they ultimately escaped from some of these conditions that you describe in rich detail in the book, uh, they they escaped uh, a little, a few at a time, right? It wasn't like they, it wasn't like a big uh, Shawshank exit, you know, where they they're right. I mean, they that's the way this happened. That's correct. Although what's interesting was when they were brought to this, what became Camp Sorghum, um, and it was named by the prisoners themselves because that was one of the rations they gave them, which was uh, sor sor sorghum syrup. Um, over a period of about six or seven weeks, there were several hundred officers that escaped, but all individually. Um, the first in this group escaped by bribing a guard and they were actually nine men who then ran because when they bribed the guard they didn't have enough money so they stuffed the wad of cash with blank paper the guard discovered it and began firing at them as they ran away from the, from the camp so that these are the type of stories that are in this book it's their their uh it's all about survival and it's all about being under great duress in a, in a prisoner of war camp. Um, yeah. And, and, and I mean, through multiple seasons and I mean, it was like, you know, these guys aren't just getting held overnight as you, you know, you, you describe, you know, the, the really, really rough conditions. Um, so what happened to these guys after the war? I don't want to spoiler alert. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, and it's funny, when I was writing the book, I, I originally outlined it and came up with the book feeling that um, when the story of their escape and, and subsequent taking the photograph itself, which is a story unto itself, uh, was over, that was the end of the book. But it's kind of like in a movie when you have a, a true story, you want to know what happened to the people afterwards. So they all went on with their lives. And really, after this photograph was made, many of them never crossed paths again. But um, you have a uh, really kind of a cross uh, section of different lives led uh, in you know the years after the war. One of the men uh, died in 1865. He had contracted typhoid uh, way back in the beginning of the war. And uh, when he got home, he never recovered and he died in October. So, and he was quite young, he was only 20. Um, the rest of them had, you know, there was a mixed bag of different uh, men that were very successful in life and others who, quite frankly, I believe suffered from PTSD. If, if you were to look at it today, they had been wounded. Uh, they had gone through um, uh, psychological torture and they all emerged with some form of PTSD, I think. Um, but they, most of them lived into the beginning of the 20th century. And several of them wrote about their experiences. One of them kept a diary with him in the entire time he was a prisoner. And what a resource that is for a guy like you, right? Oh, it was fantastic finding that. Uh, it was a type transcript, but that one of his descendants had done. And then we found the original diary handwritten, which was remarkable. Can I ask you a uh, kind of a process question? So you're go, you know, you're inspired to do this. And in our last minute here, I, I uh, uh, really think this is a, an exciting project you took on and you have to bring it all together in some kind of coherent form. And I'm just uh, wondering, um, do you, you spend there's a lot i don't know how much travels involved i don't know know how much uh, you know you have to spend to get access to something i don't know whether you have a staff or you're doing it all yourself so uh, folded 
those questions are all folded into this cool question, which is, so do you have a budget that you lay out as an author ahead of time to say, hey, I'm going to do this investigation uh, and, you know, I can I can spend this much or this much time, et cetera? Not really, although, you know, I did have to spend money to, to research this book. I had uh, a couple of private researchers that I employed in, in Washington, D.C. and in Chicago because I, it was cheaper to do that and have them go and find the answers to questions and for me to physically go there. Sure. I hired an archivist in the Pacific Northwest when we found an original of this photograph and really wanted to have it examined by a professional. So those are the things that went into it. The rest of it was honestly a giant scavenger hunt. And I just love the detective work behind that. Yeah. You know, that's what really drove me. It took two years to research and write this book. And I mean, uh, with all the detail, the detail is so rich. You could have told me it took you five years and I would have believed it. I mean, it's quite impressive. So these guys that you see in this photograph, uh, their stories and the war they were part of is all in this book, Captured Freedom from Steve Procco, and you can get it, um, well, you can get it on Amazon. Can you get it everywhere, Steve? Where can it's you on it? Amazon, and yeah. uh, there is a website for the book, capturedfreedom.com. Yeah. Um, so there's a couple places, and uh, the, since the book just came out really August 1st was its release date, uh, we're in the process of getting it into all the other retail stores you'll be, sure. be in barnes and noble and people, things like that as well that's just terrific well we'll have a, a reference to it in our um in our description uh the show and we wish you the best of luck with it man i think it's just uh, terrific that you took this project on you saw it through to completion and as i say you you have woven this tapestry of what the civil war was about with some specifics that just i was never aware of before so thank you so much well thank you for having me on yeah steve frago everybody Bye, Steve. All right. The Mark Thompson Show. Pretty wild. Yeah. Pretty wild. I hate being big. Make me little. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Yeah. Um. Very interesting. Good stuff. Uh, it, it's fascinating, and he when especially like he was taught. We were talking about the story before we came on the air today about one of those boys, as uh, men as the fourteen year old boy, hmm. and what his you know path was like. And it just fascinates me that you look at the picture, and they look like kind of it's like ghosts. Like if you've ever been to Gettysburg, and sure. you can almost picture the 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 soldiers there fighting and, and brother against brother. And you can feel like these, this, I know, it's, I know it's weird. Okay. But you can really feel their spirits there. And when you look at this picture, you kind of feel the spirits of these people. And I would, would see it too and wonder what their stories are, who they were, where they came from, you know, did they survive? What were, what was their life like? Who loved them? All these things. And uh, so that he took that Mr. Procco took the time to track all this down. That's fascinating. Oh, uh, I mean, as, yeah. as I was just listening to him and having yeah. to, you know, pursue what is a detective story on one hand, mm -hmm. and then also it's a writer's challenge on the other. You have to bring, you know, once you've done the detective work, you have to bring it all together and yeah. make it coherent, make it interesting, and he's done that. So yeah. it's called Captured Freedom. And as I say, we'll link to it in our uh, description, but you can find it uh, right now, you know, wherever you uh, Google. Google uh, it. Yeah, exactly. Google it. <laughs> <laughs> Google uh, it. Capture Freedom from Steve Procco. Um, Kim's news, and then I know everybody's running to Texas. Uh-oh. Yeah, all y'all uh, just have been in another what? family. Libby lives in Texas. Y'all can all go to hell, and yeah. I'm going back to Texas. <laughs> I like Texas, man. Bring it to me. and Give me a... Um, the most progressive city in Texas. I've talked to you about it before. Austin. I think it's arguably the most progressive uh, major city. I've talked to you before about the fact that they will slide into a lot of the same issues that we have in California in major cities like San Francisco, Sacramento, Los Angeles. And they'll slide into them for the same reasons. And that is you put a lot of people in one place and you start to run into issues with overcrowding, with lack of affordable housing, right? Because 
housing becomes more expensive, supply and demand. And now there are zoning issues. Now, I found an article that talks about it in a celebratory way. So I think you're going to enjoy hearing, because we know the truth, that which you celebrate today, you will curse tomorrow. So all of you moving to Texas. Y'all can all go to hell, and I'm going back to Texas. I got a story for you. What's happening in Austin? I also have some law and disorder on Albert's birthday. Smash it Woo-hoo! with your iron rod. Damn it, it's Albert's birthday. Smash it. We'll do it live. I can, I'll write it, and we'll do it live. We're doing Albert's birthday live, damn it. Mark Thompson Show. The Mark Thompson Show. On the Mark Thompson Show, I'm Kim McAllister. Let us begin with a weather warning. Uh, Washington, D.C., under a tornado watch as severe storms are starting to hit the east and the south today. You've got to call and check in on your parents today. The National Weather Service says there are increasing threats for thunderstorms and heavy rain. Far south is Tennessee, northern Alabama, Georgia, into southern Ohio, West Virginia, and the southwest of Pennsylvania are on alert for these storms. And again, Washington, D.C., under a tornado watch. Man. President Biden is cracking jokes about his age. While hosting World Series champions the Houston Astros at the White House Monday, President Biden praised team manager Dusty Baker, saying the people counted him out and he was just past his prime. Then President Biden joked, saying, <laughs> hell, I know something about that. Yeah. yeah, let me tell you, back in the old days, with the Black Sox scandal, when I saw that game, <laughs> yeah, he is. Uh, hey, Joe's been around a while, you know, but uh, and, and, and that's all right. Yeah. Yeah. Dusty Baker is- was that 2002 manager for the Giants that made the World Series run. Didn't w- quite win it. So I'm glad he did win it with the Astros. Oh, OK. Well, good. Yeah, good knowledge. For- <laughs> Birthday boy weighs in that's right. the sports thing. I love it. Albert, I- thank you. Yeah, I like it. There's a, uh, two mili- military veterans that have died after a drone strike in Ukraine. Former U.S. Marine Lance Lawrence and former Army officer Andrew Weber died July 29th fighting in an operation against Russian forces. That is according to various media reports and public posts from some who knew them. Uh, in a drone strike, they died. One of the biggest trucking companies in the United States is officially declaring bankruptcy. You may have heard of this um, this company. It's called Yellow Truck, and they are officially filing for bankruptcy. They kind of whole company went belly up uh, last week. They had to let thirty thousand workers, mostly Teamsters, go. Uh, the Yellow Trucking filed for Chapter Eleven bankruptcy protection. They will soon be liquidated to pay off creditors. Again, it's a Nashville-based company. And they left 30,000 workers out of a job, most of them Teamsters. Just one day you're working and the next day, no. Yeah, this is not bankruptcy protection Mm -mm. and continuing business. This is liquidation and we're done. Yeah, there's no restructuring. It's a goner. This is a big thing. A lot of people now out of work looking for the big win. It's quite elusive, the Mega Millions win. But here it comes nonetheless. This is a... (laughs) One just over one point five billion dollars is the jackpot in tomorrow's drawing. What? One and a half bill comes to a seven hundred fifty-seven million dollar lump sum before taxes. I see. I think that's false advertising. If I win one point five mil, I want a check that says Kim has one point five mil. Bill, oh, you'll rather. get the check. Oh no, no, you'll get the check <laughs> one point five mil, but it's uh, you're going to have to pay yeah. taxes on it. Oh no, no, you they'll. Uh, no. They'll give you the check. Don't worry about that. Well, and then if you if you take the lump, the cash payout instead of the lump sum, then you yeah. you're taking seven hundred fifty seven mil, not one point five bill. See how that oh, works? Yeah. So you have an issue. Uh, with odds of winning the big jackpot one in about three hundred million. Three hundred yeah. million. It used to be one in a million when I was a kid. It was one in a million. Then it was one in ten million. Now it's one in three hundred million. And we're still having a conversation about, well, you know what? I think it's unfair that the check, don't worry about how unfair it is. You're not going to win. You're not going to win it. It's okay. Move on. One in 300 million, please. Why are you yelling? I'm telling you, somebody has to win. 
Might as yeah. well be me. That's I'm why taking... people buy the tickets. Yeah. That's what you don't win. You don't have a chance, even though you know you're not going to win. It's completely illogical. I can't even explain it. Got to be know. in it to win it. Mm. Mm. Uh, ice cream truck. Pardon me. Ice cream trucks. There's a move to ban them in New York City. This just seems un-American. However, let me tell you what's happening. They're using generators. Brooklyn City Councilman Lincoln Ressler is pushing a bill that would stop Mr. Softy and other ice cream trucks from powering their soft serve machines with generators, which he says pollute the air. So he wants these trucks to switch to electric or solar power, which is better for the environment. Ice cream truck vendors say the idea is too expensive and would likely cost about $5,000 to make that change. So wow. do we keep Mr. Softy? Or do we kick him to the curb? Man, that's an interesting question. What do you think? I may. I, uh... <laughs> you're a kick him to the curber. Well, it's, it's only. It. Well, get it. get yourself an e truck. Sayonara, sucker. And then you can come back in the rent neighborhood. But that's expensive, and so maybe the city needs to, you know, lend Underwrite the money it. or no, yeah, no. have some type of program where you know they'll offer you some type of discount and help. Yeah. So I don't know. Yeah. I mean, look, uh, it's never easy. I've uh, told you, it's never easy being yeah, in this business. Yeah, the ice cream business has uh, got a lot of, you know, it, there's some challenges. It's more than just the soft serve. You've got to have a truck that, you know, maybe you get a voucher to help the proprietor. I think that there are a lot of ways around it. You there know? was an ice cream truck parked in front of our house a couple of days ago. Mm -hmm. He just kind of came to rest there, I guess. You would have thought that Santa had arrived. I mean, yeah. there was screaming and the running around of looking for money. And yeah. Well, uh, they're blaming the libs in the. Uh, Is that what they're doing? Harry Joe Jim Bob liberals. Uh, <laughs> we can't have ice cream because of the Libby hey, libs. Yeah. We like our clean. We like our clean air ice cream. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, you know, in a perfect world, people. Yeah. Lastly, Zoom is telling its employees to come back to the office. Wait a minute. If Zoom is telling people to come back to the office, you know it's over. <laughs> uh, the platform became a staple app during the height of COVID at work and for personal use. A spokesperson. What for the Zoom hell is going on in the United States of America? Ron, Ron gets it. The Zoom people say they believe in a structured hybrid approach to be mm. the most effective for its employees. Workers who live close to an office will be required to work on site to interact with their teams. No more Zooming into Zoom. Mm -mm. Wow. It's yeah. tough. This report is sponsored by... Oh, I do want to mention Coachella Valley Coffee. That's right. Because I'll tell you something that's uh, really special. Um... I'm getting a lot of emails from people saying that they uh, went to Coachella Valley Coffee and they are loving it. And you know, mm -hmm. I've said it before, being a coffee hound, I mean, I just have, as you know, I've, I've got the three burr grinders and I've got this machine. I, I, may, <laughs> I may make between 15 and 20 cups of espresso a day, but we also do oh, French God. press and pour overs. But let me just be clear, I don't drink the entire, like, I'll put it down on the counter. There's a part of me that is just just enjoys the taste fresh out of the draw. So when I give you that number, I probably, I don't know how many, maybe I drink half that. But uh, CoachellaValleyCoffee.com, you go to the website and you knock around and you get whatever coffee you want. You get whatever items you want. They have teas. They're brilliant. It's fresh grow. That's the biggest difference between Coachella Valley, I think, and a lot of these you know, low cost beans that you may find in your uh, online or in the grocery store, they can discount beans <laughs> elsewhere because they're old grow. Okay. Yeah. So they've been lying around a lot. This is fresh grow new crop. And I want you to try it and use the code Mark T at checkout for 10% off. And I'm getting so many emails. I'll read a bunch tomorrow of people who are really loving it. I think literally, it's the best coffee I've ever tasted. Now, I like the Ocotillo Espresso, but there are others on there. You pick out the one that you like. Get the bean that works for you. We have a, an order headed to our house right now. And my husband, who's the coffee drinker, I'm not a coffee drinker. I like iced tea and tea. He um, called because they didn't have the exact roast like is it a light roast is it a dark roast what's the crack what's the he's very mm -hmm. into this whole roasting thing oh good 
And he called and talked to the the gentleman that owns the Coachella Valley Coffee. Mm-hmm. And they became fast friends. And they talked all about coffee and, you know, what what his likes were and what the the man who owns the his likes are and all about roasting and how he got it. So th- they're very nice people. And so I, I'll let you know how it goes at our house. But he put a little tea in there for me as well. They have a mango tea that they say is really good for making iced tea. And they also have a vanilla tea, which I'm, I'm excited to try well courtney drinks the tea just like you do and they've got okay. great teas also it's just that i'm not a super big tea drinker so i can't speak with authority on that mm-hmm. and so i could you know i can't recommend I'll because let you i don't know. I'm, yeah i don't know enough but uh i can totally recommend it on the coffee side but mm-hmm. there is that yeah there's all sorts of, and you get 10 percent off everything anything you order on the site with the discount code mark t you get 10 percent off coachella valley coffee.com you can and see it there at the bottom of the screen so yeah and uh, they're friends of the show, and I appreciate uh, their support and love that so many of our listeners have uh, stepped up to uh, to try them because they're yeah. pretty great. All right. Uh, awesome. Smash the like button for Kim. That's her big newscast. Thanks to Woo-hoo! Coachella for, uh, for sponsoring it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right on, right on, right on. Mm-hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Shadow Stevens. This is the Mark Thompson Show. Give it to yourself. <laughs> yeah, we are excited because it's Albert's birthday. He only gets one a year. And so we're super excited. We've uh, already said rest in peace to the great William Friedkin, the uh, director. And uh, we've covered uh, some news related to, uh, to Trump, the women's soccer team, to... Uh, various things going on around the Bay Area as well. I wanted to mention, because so many Californians are leaving to go to Austin, Texas, because Austin, Texas is viewed as a, maybe a more liberal environment, maybe more li- than the rest of Texas, that is. Sayonara, uh, sucker. Yeah. And then <laughs> <laughs> I want to try something new. Okay. Well, I mean, there is that. Uh, I, I also think that uh, I always hear about how everybody's leaving, but let me just say, the price of housing here in California ain't going down. So yeah. I, not enough of you are leaving. So, again, as as Kim says, let me take you to the airport, all right? Uh, <laughs> all right? The Austin housing market, though, with all these people going there to Texas, is now having to face new zoning laws. Now, if you're moving to Austin, these new zoning laws are probably good, but demand for housing in Austin has outstripped even its relatively rapid housing production. They're building houses as fast as they can, but so many people are moving to Austin. They want to be part of the big Texas party down there. So the city recently passed a resolution that would allow more dense housing construction. And again, they celebrate this. What I'm telling you is that those things that frustrate you about California perhaps are related to density of housing, this sort of thing they are now going to become issues in this place that is sort of viewed as the Shangri-La, which is Austin, Texas. Um, Austin oh. is suffering from rapid... Oh, it just arrived. It the just Coachella arrived. Co- wow. It just arrived. And it, it arrived in a tote bag. Wow. It says here, the Stars and Stripes with America, it says small batch artisanal coffee roasting coachellacoffee.com coachella valley coffee.com and here is the the coffee it is the honduras oh no it's not it's a what is it? it's a it's milk chocolate almond and dried fruit oh it is coffee no it's just those are the notes those are the tasting notes yeah. so it may it'll have I thought notes there's never been anything like this yeah. coachella valley coffee there it is yeah Anyway, yeah. sorry so to interrupt you, it. Kind no, no, that's cool. Delivery. I'm glad. It, I'm glad. It, I'm glad yeah. you got the delivery in, during the show. And I have to say that <laughs> that's what's great about the website. If you do go there, they'll give you little notes like that. Like this coffee yeah. has notes of these things. It might be chocolate. It might be fruit. It might be whatever. Yeah. So you'll get a sense of that. And a bold coffee, a lighter coffee, a morning coffee, an evening, etc. So you'll you'll yeah, check cool. it all out. But I'm I'm nice. glad it arrived. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, so back to the Austin sh- story. They're suffering from a rapidly worsening housing crisis. But the city's government has moved to push for denser building. And so they have relaxed zoning restrictions. It's been the last 10 years uh, during which the move to Austin has affected 
so many. You've got tech companies, Apple, Amazon, Tesla, all moved to the city. Median home prices in Austin more than doubled between 2011 and now. And they have built a lot, but not enough. So they have new zoning measures designed to incentivize, quote, gentle density. That's what they call it in Texas. So it'll allow townhomes, duplexes, triplexes, all to be built on single family lots. So it'll be a denser, more diverse kind of housing choice. Uh, I mention it, I'll put it on um, my Twitter feed if you want to read more, but all I'm saying is that many of the challenges that we have in California, because so many people need housing, they exist in this place that formerly didn't have these challenges. So they are awakening to the importance of housing at the Capitol, said one activist. Step one is to realize that there's a problem. Step two is to start looking for solutions, and that conversation is growing pretty fast. So that's the latest on that from uh, our pals in uh, in Texas. The Mark Thompson Show. Lake Tahoe has higher concentrations of microplastics Mm -mm. than an ocean trash heap. Sparkling, beautiful Lake Tahoe. The clear blue waters, Kim. They hide the reality. This is really upsetting. Yeah. More microplastic concentrations than those observed in ocean gyres, those huge collections of accumulated plastic waste. Researchers first reported microplastics in Lake Tahoe back in 2019. I mean, that was in itself a troubling discovery. But this new study, this was a postdoctoral scholar from Italy who came here to look at the waters of Lake Tahoe, filtered for microplastics larger than 250 microns. That's about the width of three strands of hair. And it's brutal what she found. So we often think about plastics being developed in watersheds, moving into the ocean, collecting there. But what this study shows is that fresh waters, including lakes and reservoirs, are themselves important conduits of plastic. Well, look what at how we is, treat. Look how we yeah. treated it. Look That's how we treated it. it on. This is July fourth of this year. Mm. Look at the plastic cups and the things. They had to have a big old beach cleanup. But this is how we've treated our beautiful places in years past. So what do we expect that if we treat our our resources like this, that they're going to get trashed? And I have to say, uh, that's the way we treated our planet. That picture that you saw, that's the way we treated the planet. It's, it's just, uh, it's been trashed. So, okay, so now what? All right, so now we turn the corner and we try to institute more aggressive policies to roll that back. It, it's, it's, it's simple. We need to go the opposite direction. So... Uh, sad reality at Lake Tahoe. I mean, despite mm-hmm. its beauty, I think it's one of the most beautiful places in the world. Yeah. Uh, there are challenges, and it and they speak to overall challenges as well. So, um, the Mark Thompson Show. Mm-hmm. Well, I um, I haven't had any hot water in my home for three days. What happened? Exactly. What happened? That's so that kind of what? puts a damper on the coffee making. Here's what happened. <laughs> well, coffee making, I don't need hot water. Remember, it the machines heat it. Okay. But I um we noticed that the water wasn't on and like it was no no hot water. And then uh I was able to uh contact someone. This is the new I was talking about technology the other day. Check this out. The new setup now when you call a plumber is that the switchboard for the plumber handles like 19 or 20 other plumbers. 
it just all comes to one switchboard, right? That's the that's been plumbing, around for a while, right? Plumbing dispatch, yeah. Right, meaning mm -hmm. uh, you don't know this. They all have separate listings when you Google it or whatever you do. But Google it. the idea is you call, you know, North Bay Plumbing. Right. Uh, and you get Geo, who answers at North B Bay Plumbing. Then you get Marin Plumbing Incorporated, and Geo answers for Marin uh, Plumbing <laughs> Incorporated also. And you go, and then you get uh, Ready to Work, San Francisco plumbers and geo answers for them. And there's a good yeah. reason for that because San Francisco ready to work plumbers and uh, the Marin plumbers and the North Bay plumbers don't want to have to employ a separate person to answer the phone and dispatch calls. This way we all kick in all the plumbing uh, companies. We all mm -hmm. kick in a little bit and we have one person who is the dispatcher for all these companies. It's a savings mm -hmm. to all of us business owners. That Geo really gets around. And Geo was <laughs> handling, and by the way, his name is Geo. That's how I came up with that because I was, so I call like, I, I'm calling it because it's desperate. You have no hot water. So I call, like, I might call, I don't know, a dozen, 15 different ones. And after like six or seven, it's all the same electronic prompts. And then you get this guy on the phone. I said, Geo, are you answering the phone for everybody I call? Because I want to try to get an alternative here. And he said, yeah. well, I answer for a lot of it. You have to, you know, get, so I'm going like three, four pages into a Google search. Anyway, here's the, here's the bottom line. Can't get anybody to come out. Oh, no. Except I get one guy who's ready to come out um, uh, late, um, late in the day. And so he fixes it for like, like that long, okay? Yeah. We have a tankless water heater, okay? So do and we. so they're very, so it's not a, uh, it's not like a water heater with that heats the water. Right. And it's a big tank, you know, it's tankless. Yeah. Um, so there are not as many who can do that. You can't just get any plumber because apparently that's a, you know, it's probably like, like an electric car or something. Not every mechanic can work on it. Anyway, Courtney gets the window during which there was hot water. Okay, like she gets she, he fixed it for like that long mm -hmm. and she caught the that long, right? Mm -hmm. Which which is actually a good thing. Yeah. But I'm left with, you know, oh, it's just not coming up, blah blah blah. So now we've got the guy coming back out. It's been it's been days now. As it turns out, I got a I got a little bit of a shower last night, so I feel better, but um it was, you know, not a hot shower. <laughs> it's interesting. I had to call a plumber the other day too. The uh, the shower handle came off in my son's hand, and water was pouring out of the, oh of my the hole. God. And we're like, yeah. So my husband had to turn the water off to the whole house, and <sighs> it stayed that way overnight. Um, and but the they came like like that and fixed it in an instant. They knew exactly what was wrong. It was a little mechanism done. Fixed. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So it wasn't expensive either. No. Mm -mm. Mm. Well, I mean, it's so, always expensive because the minute they show up at your house, it's like, you know. Well, check this out. Let me just on the expense. Now I want to tell you something about Ivanka and Jared in a second. Uh-oh. But um, the guy shows up. He does it. He fixed it for that long, as I told you. Yeah. So everything seemed fine. And then he says, so it's either check, Zell, or cash. Or if you want to give me a credit card, I have to charge you 3%. So I said, I don't have Zelle. I don't mm -hmm. have checks. I don't have that kind of cash lying around. So I guess it's going to be I guess I'm sucking up the 3%. <laughs> but then I thought, well, wait a minute. Maybe if I cobbled it. So I did. I scraped together the cash. Right. And I, and I paid him mostly in cash and then a little bit of, uh, I Venmoed the plumber who then paid the actual server. Okay. So it's like crazy. Right. Then when there are problems, where do you go? You have to, Call in other Gio. words, it's a cash transaction though. Oh. You know what I mean? This, all of a sudden I thought, you know what? It's worth the 3% to be able yeah. to, you know, they don't. So that's yeah. my situation with the, uh, it's not a particularly good story, but it's a story of the moment. It's happening yeah. right this instant. So, I mean, for Albert's birthday, I would think they would at least, uh, you know, fix the hot water. Albert, here. thank you. Yeah, that's all I'm asking, Albert, as a gift to, to you.
why not help me? Albert, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, just someone get uh, Mark some warm water so he could take a shower, please. Yeah, please. Uh, all right, I have a, a story I, because I saw people. I think they like the the red meat of um, something related to Trump. So I'm going to give you that in a, a Jared the Mark Thompson show and a Vanka story. They are um, <laughs> paid in Mark's merch. That's great. <laughs> I wonder if I can interest you in a coffee mug, and we could just call it even. Uh, Zell is great. You just need to make sure you are connecting to who you want. Once the money is sent, it's gone. Yeah. Well, I mean, I have Venmo, and uh, what else do I have, Kim? <laughs> uh, PayPal, Venmo. Pa yes, like, how many PayPal, do you have? Venmo, it's like social right. media exactly. apps. Cash, do you really need the them cash all? app. Right. I have the cash app. Um, Apple Pay. The um, uh, there was a piece in the Washington Post this weekend, which I thought was kind of well written, and it it has that bite that I thought you might enjoy hearing. It's uh, called "Jared and Ivanka Are Slinking Back to Gomorrah." Oh, um, they um, uh, I'll just try to get pull some quotes. Um, both spawns of excessive wealth and privilege, Ivanka and Jared, are reason enough to cast Donald Trump into the outer darkness. Their presence in the White House from 2017 to 2021 was a frequent embarrassment as they convinced themselves that their value amounted to more than the family name. For a while after the 2020 election, they distanced themselves from Trump, which meant they were all, we were all spared their spectral visages oh my god i love the way these writers write and I, yeah of course at least one um their timing though as to returning now to the trump orbit is undoubtedly connected to recent polling showing trump leading his gop competitors they want to be relevant again right family loyalty apparently is a lot like reality tv it's all about the ratings However, reports of the couple dropping in on meetings and attending family gatherings came before a federal grand jury issued a four-count criminal indictment charging Trump with co-conspiring to overturn what we know, right? Uh, so now, everybody, I should say, there's a sense of Ivanka and Jared, they're not sure which way they're going. Trump could be doomed or not. With him, one never knows. It's hard to gauge whether these latest charges will budge his supporters. I doubt it, says this writer, since to be a Trump fan is to distrust everyone other than he who must be obeyed. Nor do supporters probably care that Jared and Ivanka took advantage of their White House status to enrich themselves. Ivanka might be forgiven for her conflicted relationship with Trump. He's daddy, after all. But familiar attachments do not and did not qualify her or Kushner to serve as senior advisors for the President of the United States. This is what I talked about ad nauseum on KGO, you remember? When I talked about him getting, both of them, everybody got denied security clearance, all of them, because they had too many foreign interests. They were compromised. And so the security establishment, they said, well, we can't give these guys even basic security clearance. And Trump big-footed it at all. Um, when Kushner was denied security clearance by career intelligence officers because of concerns about foreign influence, outside business interests, and personal conduct, Trump overrode them. Uh, as for Kushner's credulity straining role as impromptu diplomat to the Middle East, we can only wonder what other conversations took place as he persuaded leaders in Israel, the UAE, Bahrain, Sudan, and Morocco to recognize Israel's sovereignty and normalize relations among them. The Abraham Lincoln Accords, the Abraham Accords they're called, widely reviewed as, uh, I don't think it was Abraham Lincoln actually, I think it was Abraham Accords related to I'm guessing the prophet Abraham. Um, development toward building relationships and mitigating tensions in the Persian Gulf region. She goes on and on and on. But essentially what's happening and is suggested here, and of course it's this is written with a heavy dose of sourness toward both of them, is as they uh, finished the troubled service to Trump during his presidency, they skulked away as you know jared kushner got two billion dollars from the saudis clearly i i think it reflected some you know arrangement and you didn't hear anything more of them now with trump leading 
in the latest polls, he leads by 40 points. His, I'm talking about uh, his GOP competitors. It's possible that Jared and Ivanka reemerge, you know, and uh, the sequel is written. We will see. But, you know, this is all happening um, at a time that uh, Donald Trump is embattled, of course. But if you're Ivanka and Jared, uh, you see perhaps growing opportunities. Uh, the truth is all three of these entitled darlings are skunks. Hunter, Ivanka, and Jared. Mm. They smell of corruption, indeed. Uh, well, Hunter's not working in the White House, right? No, exactly. There's a huge difference. Now, I do think, as you know, uh, I do think that Hunter, he obviously capitalized on his name. He obviously capitalized on the implication that he had access to the president. And he mm -hmm. did have access to the president. Was I mean, the vice president, you know, uh, Biden. But that wasn't going to lead to anything. You know, Biden kept kept himself out of that game. But I will say this. I don't think Biden kept himself enough out of that game. I think Biden was available for calls. Not that he was doing anything on the calls. I don't think Biden, as I say, was doing anything helping Jared trade on the family name in the way of substantive help. I think he literally just got, this is what the, their star witness said the other day. He literally got on the air and just uh, on the phone call and just said, hey, you know, glad I could uh, meet you guys by phone. Good luck with everything. He kept it really arm's length. But what I would have liked to have him do is not get on the call at all. So that's where Biden and I part company. Yeah. But Hunter is definitely a train wreck. No question about it. But I, I just, I'm so over the whataboutism. So you can't look at the Trump children who worked in the White House had access to, you know, all the all this information who, you know, were there in the little tent on January 6th, whooping and hollering. There's a huge difference between their involvement in their father's presidency and Hunter Biden's. It's completely different. And and to derail the discussion about Trump, what Trump has done, what he's charged with, what his children have done, how they may be involved, whatever, that's a whole separate situation. And so when we talk about that, I don't want to hear Hunter's name mentioned. If you want to talk about Hunter, let's do that in the Hunter talk. But don't try to conflate the two because they have nothing to do with each other. I think when it comes to corruption in Washington, you can talk about Hunter, you can talk about Jared, you can talk about Ivanka. Uh, but I do think you draw an important distinction, which is Hunter was not serving in the administration. No. You had in Jar Jared essentially was the secretary of everything. That's what they called him in all of the various books, uh, books written about uh, Kushner, Kushner Inc., I think from Vicky, whose name I always forget. I think she's so great. But anyway, that book, um, David K. Johnston wrote about it. Uh, the, the fact is, Jared Kushner ran everything. And here's a guy who had major, major security issues, never would have been cleared. And he was running everything. He ran the COVID response team. So, uh, and as you know, during that COVID response team's work, we find out that most of them had nothing in the way of experience when it came to getting PPE or getting any of these things that were required for the systems that were to deal with the uh, pandemic. So... Uh, Albert, I have a question for you. You are the birthday boy. Do you want me to, uh, I don't think I can. Can I can't slam a story from the sky. I think we're almost done, right? Aww. We are sorry. almost done. We could maybe just squeeze in one last story. If it's just a, like a story, a singular story from the sky. <laughs> um, I can do, I, I'm going to squeeze two, but they're really short stories from stories in the sky. Do you have the open and close? Let me see. I do. Are you ready? All right. All right. Albert, thank you. All right, go for it. Yeah. Here we, go. we have clearance, Clarence. Roger, Roger. What's our vector, Victor? Enough is enough. I have had it with these monkey fighting snakes on this Monday to Friday play. Everybody strap in. American Airlines earning support for a pre-flight speech that he made <laughs> in which he warned passengers to be courteous, respectful, and to generally refrain from being jerks to their seatmates. That's right. It went viral. 
the uh, footage containing this no-nonsense speech. And the captain said, uh, he said, uh, you will listen to what the crew has to say because they represent my will in the cockpit or in the cabin. (laughs) And my will is what matters. It's a total dad like speech. It's great. Yeah, it really is true. Yeah, I, I, I mean, he's a tough. He's he's. This is Kim's kind of pilot. You know what I yeah. mean? Yeah. Good day, sir. All right. Don't lean on other people. Don't fall asleep on other people. Don't pass out on other people. Don't drool on other people, unless you've talked about it and they have a weather-resistant jacket. Um. Then on cell phone usage, that is over, over and done in this country. Nobody wants to hear your video. I know you think your video is super sweet, and it probably is, but it's your business, right? So keep it to yourself. <laughs> Good day, sir. All right. I mean, uh, how, where, what have we come to that the pilot has to tell people to be conscientious aboard the plane? He says, use your AirPods, use your headphones, whatever it is. That's your business, okay? It's just part of being in a respectful society. Good day, sir. (laughs) Okay. All right. Nobody's listening. Fine, he says. (laughs) Uh, A word to my middle seat passengers. You own both armrests. That's my gift to you. Welcome (laughs) aboard our flight. (laughs) Thanks, Dad. Yeah, that was it. He's a tough guy. Carry on in the cockpit. Right. I mean, I could just picture myself in the back seat of a, a you know giant old sedan in the in the eighties. <laughs> this is my right. will. Here's I'm going to turn rules. this plane around. That's that right. Uh, and finally, uh, this Sandra Schuster from Denver. She was told that they'd lost her bag and they didn't know where it was. What? She called multiple times. That's right. But she had a tracking device in the bag, and it showed that the bag was at Chicago's O'Hare. Why are you yelling? Her airline, United, was doing nothing about that. She, Schuster, and her 15-year-old daughter, (laughs) Ruby, who plays lacrosse. My bad. I'm sorry. (laughs) They did throw it in there. They had been to Baltimore for a rugby tournament, a lacrosse tournament, I guess. Why are you yelling? They traveled with carry-on bags for their clothes, but it checked one bag containing Ruby's lacrosse kit. When they arrived at Denver after midnight, the bag wasn't on the belt. United reps at Denver gave them a case number, told them the bag should arrive by 8.30. It didn't, and they were just getting the runaround, they felt. They had the AirTag, the tracking device from Apple. They showed that it was in Chicago. They said, I told them I could see it at Terminal 1 baggage reclaim in Chicago. They said, we have no record of it. I asked them to call Chicago. They said, no, we're not allowed to call. What? They said they'd put notes in the system and the baggage team would take care of it. When the bag still didn't arrive, Schuster called a third time. And they said, we have no idea where it is. So they got on a plane. Isn't that what happened? Oh, I would have called Chicago O'Hare, but they, they flew out there? Yeah. Uh, they got on a plane, uh, been told they couldn't locate it, the United people said. She called United three times. She booked flights two hours each way, $30 in taxes, and she went to Chicago, got the bag, found it in 30 seconds. Oh, my gosh. I mean, that's your favorite sweaters in there, right? Because, I mean, and in my suitcase, it's like underwear, some shoes. Yeah, like, I don't take your time, boys. I don't care <laughs> like, how long it takes. What's in there that's so me. important that you would book a yeah. flight to go get it? But okay. She'd send pictures of the bag, the claim ticket, everything. But they, they anyway, she... Uh, she got the bag, and uh, she's not trying to get travel credit for her. <laughs> yeah, I think she got thirty. I think she got thirty thousand miles. Oh, I see. Well, she did get thirty thousand miles. Yeah. Good, 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 good. So United took care of it in the end. But uh, that story's from the sky for today. This has been stories from the sky. The captain has turned off the seatbelt sign, and you are now free to move about the cabin. We have had a lot of fun today. I'll remind you. Wow, Billy DeBono. Come on, Billy DeBono. Big shout out. Big shout out. We all wish 
uh, you back. Uh, what does it say, uh, Albert or Kim? Please. Happy birthday, Albert. We all <laughs> wish that you will make it back another year for car to carry this excellent show. Uh, this is Billy from the 530. No, I bucks. love it. Kim, how are you? Nice. Very good. Billy from the 530, thank you. Albert, thank you. And thank you, Albert, for uh, for your birthday. You're very, big shout uh, out. Big shout out to Billy, to everybody who has helped celebrate uh, Albert's birthday. It's really been a... Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Today. It's been a day of, uh, of restrained celebration because we have to pace ourselves. You know, Albert has big plans. Although, as Albert becomes more mature he's turned down the raucous frat boy drunk thing that he does and he's kind of i think i've noticed albert you're more about the an experiential aspect to your birthday am i right about that sir yeah no yeah i feel like i'm, I'm enjoying wine a lot more too so yeah. Like oh yeah yeah i know that's great Karen Cooper says, happy Albert Albert, working on organizing National Albert Day Parade. <laughs> Thank you so, so Thank much. Thank you so, so much, Karen. I love it. Thank you all for smashing the like button. Smash it with your iron rod. And I haven't even mentioned our website and stuff, but, you know, we'll, get, we'll mention it tomorrow. All the ways you support us through Patreon and PayPal. I'm Shadow Stevens for the Mark Johnson Show. Bye-bye. Albert, happy birthday. There's a big Out of time. after bye, bye. party live going on now. Head on over there. Till tomorrow. Bye-bye.